And item two, we have two presentations, and the first one will be by Lazard. And Jake, you want to say anything for? Uh, just uh, briefly, so just a regular update from your two uh, international development managers. Haven't heard from them in a while, so we certainly timely as international markets certainly struggled uh, over the last year. A lot of things going on in, in Europe. Asia, uh, currency issues that I'm sure the managers will, will touch on. So first we have Lazard, which is your international value manager, and then Harding Levner, international growth manager. Okay. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Got uh, 30 minutes, probably 20, uh, and then the rest for Q&A, or however you want to do it. I'll Great. I can, I can keep it to that time for sure. Uh, thanks, for everybody, for inviting us to, to speak with you today. Um, my name is Rob Thala. I'm from Lazard Asset Management, uh, and we manage the uh, International Strategic Equity Portfolio, which is your, your value portfolio for developed international markets. Uh, you may know Tony Doty and Mike Powers, who, who have been here before. Uh, they send their regards, but they could not be here today. I've been at Lazard for 13 years and in the business uh, for 23 years. And uh, I'm a, a client portfolio manager on the international side of the business. Just want to give you a very quick reminder of the firm uh, and the team, uh, the portfolio management team, as well as uh, the philosophy process, and, and then get into the, uh, the performance of the portfolio. And probably what is most important to everybody here would be our outlook and what's going on in all the international markets, because there's a tremendous amount of uh, macro noise going on right now. So let me move this here. Uh, if you flip to page three, you can see the, uh, uh, the spots around the globe where Lazard Asset Management has, uh, has businesses. We're a large global firm, 180 billion of assets under management. Uh, and importantly, we manage local portfolios all around the globe, and we're bringing that local insight back to our international team, uh, which operates both in New York and London. If you flip forward a couple of pages to uh, page five, that $180 billion uh, in assets, uh, of that, about 75% of our assets under management are global and international in nature. So we do have deep experience managing uh, non-US portfolios. Uh, page six shows the team. Uh, this is an incredibly solid team uh, at our firm, led by Mark Little at the top of the page, uh, who has been running this particular product uh, since uh, 2003. So he's, he's coming on 12 years of leadership of this product. Uh, you'll see Mike Bennett and John Reinsberg also there. Uh, they have been leading our international platform, uh, the business side of things, uh, for over 20 years. Next page shows how we kind of break down uh, our investment resources in terms of analytical uh, resources. Uh, and we, we organize this research effort uh, by sectors globally. So you'll see all the, the sectors uh, and the analysts that, uh, that cover those sectors on a global basis. And it's important, the, big, the important takeaway here is that all the analysts do share information on a global basis. Uh, and it's a real partnership between the portfolio management team and the, uh, and the analysts. Uh, no analysts run sleeves within the portfolio by themselves. It's definitely a partnership between uh, the analysts and the portfolio management team. So that's enough on the firm. If you flip to page, uh, page eight, we'll get into the, uh, the kinds of companies we're looking for and the philosophy and process that has been very consistent and stable in this product and across all of our international platform uh, for more than two decades. So our investment philosophy is to identify companies that, uh, can, that can generate sustainably high financial productivity, which we define by return on equity and return on capital, and marry that with commensurate valuations. We're firm believers that companies that have sustainably high uh, financial productivity do garner higher valuations. And the market often misprices the sustainability or the persistency of that uh, return pattern, and that gives us the opportunity to get in. So in years two, three, four, five of projections, uh, investors oftentimes believe that 
companies with high returns will fade back down to lower levels. And our job as fundamental analysts will be to identify those companies that can sustain those returns. And as those valuations fade, uh, that gives us the opportunity to get in at valuations that make sense to us. We also look for companies that are improving. So maybe a new, a new management team is coming in. A, uh, a restructuring has been, uh, is going on within the company. Maybe they're selling off an unprofitable business. Whatever they're doing to improve that return pattern uh, and, and, and bring it up to where their peers may be, uh, those kinds of companies are also uh, very much on our radar screen. Uh, all the portfolios are built on a bottom-up basis with the resulting sectors and regional uh, allocations uh, being really a residual of where we're finding that, that valuation uh, and financial productivity trade-off. Uh, within this portfolio, uh, international strategic equity, uh, we can invest up to 15% in emerging markets. And our benchmark is the EFI, uh, MSCI EFI benchmark, and we can deviate from sectors and, and regions by plus or minus 15%. So again, up to 15% up to in emerging markets. Uh, additionally, one other uh, distinguishing characteristic of, of this portfolio is that we do have market cap flexibility. So we can go down all the way down to uh, 300 million in market cap right now. Uh, and most of the time, it does have more of a, a mid and larger cap flavor, but we do have some securities less than $1 billion. Uh, because we focus all of our energy on the bottom up and building the portfolio stock by stock, brick by brick, uh, we generate virtually all and in some cases more than all of our relative performance from stock selection. And we have a slide to show you this in terms of attribution. Where is that the, the relative performance coming from? Uh, sector by sector, region by region, it's really stock uh, selection. It is not an allocation to a sector or an allocation to a region that drives our performance. And we believe strongly that by focusing on companies with high financial productivity and discounted valuations, that we can generate a much more repeatable pattern of performance as opposed to uh, you know, a top-down investment strategy where we would be picking regions and sectors along with stocks. We try to keep it as simple as possible, focus on the stocks, and where the sectors and regions fall out uh, is where we're finding that, that relative value trade-off. Uh, if you want to flip forward to the next tab on page 12, we'll get into the market summary and, uh, and, uh, and performance of the portfolio over the past year. Uh, 2014, uh, international markets overall were weak, but this was primarily due to currency translation. In fact, local markets were up 6% uh, last year, which is shocking to most people. Uh, and it was really that currency translation that impacted uh, U.S. dollar investors in non-U.S. Uh, portfolios. So we'll get into the currency impact in a little bit, and uh, I want to discuss that because that's really the, the hot topic today. Um, so we'll save that for a few minutes. On the bottom of page 12, you can uh, see a couple of bullets on, on our outlook. Uh, really, what we're looking for this year is for corporate earnings in, in uh, non-US developed markets to, to start to catch up to valuations. Uh, 2014, uh, actually, if, if you rewind the clock to the beginning of 2014, valuations started the year at or above long-term averages, having risen substantially in the prior few years from well below uh, long-term averages. So if you think about you know, a balloon where you would you'd press on one side and you're going to see the balloon move on the other side, valuations uh, were, were pressed over the past couple of years. We'll get into this in a little bit more detail. Um, beginning 2014, what you saw on the other side of the balloon was, was returns, and the returns of our portfolio, the ROE of our portfolio, moved up substantially in 2014, which helped drive our relative performance versus the benchmark. It wasn't really the valuation component. It was the return on equity component that was a, a big driver for us. Um, as a result of the fact that valuations had moved up coming into 2014, uh, we had been trimming what we thought were more vulnerable stocks that maybe couldn't sustain the returns that we, that we had been looking for, that return on equity. 
and you'll see that many that uh, a lot of those those trims and cells in the portfolio came from continental Europe, which was really the epicenter for uh, the the slowdown relative to expectations uh, on a regional basis in 2014. So lots of macro uncertainty going on right now. Country specific, obviously, we have Greece uh, and Russia, which are are the uh, the, the real uh, epicenter of, of country specific issues going on right now. Uh, from a ma more macro standpoint, we've got the, the euro and the ECB and what they're doing with uh, the quantitative easing, uh, which we'll again discuss uh, in a little bit. But we continue to focus on stocks and, and really trying to avoid directional bets from a sector and from a regional standpoint. Page uh, 13 just shows uh, the performance of sectors uh, and regions uh, or countries in local currency. And this gets back to what I said about uh, the markets actually being up 6% in local currency. You can see here most of the sectors in local currency were uh, positive and some of them meaningfully so. You can see that the, the top sectors, healthcare and utilities, uh, drove the market last year. And that's a function of the fact that there was a real search for yield. Anything that had a, a substantial and, and uh, solid dividend yield, and these are the sectors where you would identify some of those kinds of companies, uh, this is the area that did the best because global bond yields fell in, a, in what, what feels like a race to zero, uh, and, and there was a real search for yield, which, which very much picked up uh, during the summertime when, when bond yields started falling pretty substantially. <clears throat> so there was a, a very strong uh, tailwind for defensive-like sectors. Page 14 shows that impact of the dollar last year. Uh, the strong dollar was universal against all currencies. Uh, and this is a function of most people uh, watching what the U.S. Fed is doing in terms of uh, the potential for uh, tapering the quantitative easing and the, uh, the potential for rising rates in the U.S., whereas the rest of uh, the globe is seemingly uh, lowering rates. So the dollar was, was the story uh, for 2014. Page 15 shows uh, market performance in U.S. dollars by sector. And you can just take that slide from two pages ago and layer on the currency impact, and you get uh, a, a much different picture. Uh, than we saw from local currencies. Now we'll get into uh, more of the performance of the actual portfolio. Page 17, uh, we, uh, we began uh, managing uh, uh, this portfolio in September of 2013, and we've done a, a good job on a relative basis uh, since then, with uh, since inception performance has been up 7% with uh, 282 basis points of net relative performance versus our EV benchmark. Uh, there is a typo here. That two-year column should not be here because obviously we haven't uh, uh, been uh, managing this portfolio for two years. So I apologize for that. But on a one-year basis, uh, from a stock selection standpoint and from a relative performance standpoint, we had a good year, uh, albeit down. In a, in a net, uh, on a net basis, and again, all of that due uh, to currency. The next two pages are really the, the big takeaways for us from an attribution standpoint. So you'll see on page 18 and on page 19, what we're doing here is looking at year to date and fourth quarter, so uh, let's just talk about the, the full year, which is the top panel of page 18 and page 19. And if we're doing our job well, we are uh, contributing positive relative basis points. All the numbers on this page are relative to the benchmark. We're generating positive stock selection. So you see that line uh, that indicates stock selection versus sector allocation. We're trying to generate all the performance of the portfolio from picking stocks and not picking sectors or regions. So you can see uh, through for the full year, 2014, we generated 446 basis points of uh, relative performance versus the benchmark via stock selection and only 22 uh, residual basis points positive from uh, the sector allocations that fell out from, from that stock selection. So 
what you want to see is uh, positive attribution in almost every sector. And commensurately, if you flip to the next page, uh, you can see a, a pretty similar picture uh, from a regional perspective. We generated 352 positive uh, relative basis points uh, in total in 2014 from stock selection when you compare stocks versus regions. Importantly, uh, we did generate positive attribution in continental Europe, which uh, most people think you know, is in recession and very weak relative to expectations. Uh, we don't have a recession going on in continental Europe. We'll get into that in a second. But it's just flat. There's no growth. And expectations coming into 2014 was for some more growth. So there was a resetting of those expectations. And we saw that through the currency. But because of our focus on that stock selection, we were able to generate uh, positive attribution even in a very difficult region in continental Europe. Uh, next, let's flip to page 22. This gives you a flavor of, of changes that were made in the portfolio on a sector and regional basis throughout 2014. And, and now we're going to get into a bit more of the macro discussion because where we're finding relative value on a stock basis is oftentimes illustrative of what's going on regionally and, and in different sectors. But we'll focus on the regions for this discussion. So I want to draw your attention down to continental Europe at the uh, bottom right of the page. So we began 2014 about 9% underweight continental Europe. And obviously, this excludes the UK. And I want to go back to that discussion where I said uh, the, the valuations have moved up over the past couple of years. So when, you came out, when we came out of the European debt crisis in 2011, valuations were extremely cheap, nine, ten times forward earnings for the benchmarks. And we had uh, a lot of stocks that were screening very well for us. We had very strong 20% compounded returns in the benchmark, which we outperformed in 2012 and 13, but all of that performance in the benchmark was driven by multiple expansion. So there's two ways to make money in stocks, multiple moves up or earnings growth. So all of that move was really generated by the multiple expansion. So when you press on that one side of the balloon, we, we saw the valuations move from 9 to 10 times earnings to 14, 15 times as we entered 2014. We noticed on a stock level, there were fewer companies that uh, we owned in the portfolio within continental Europe, but fewer that we could find that we actually didn't own uh, that we thought would generate a substantially high return on equity given that higher valuation. So you saw us throughout the year trim back our existing holdings and not really add to many uh, new holdings uh, within continental Europe. So we wound up the year down or underweight uh, continental Europe by more than 13 percent. This is near uh, what we would be in terms of a max uh, underweight relative to the benchmark. If you, if you look up the page, you can see emerging markets where uh, we started the year 11 percent overweight and wound up the year at a, at a similar overweight but about 13 percent uh, by the end of the year. This was a function of in 2013 I'll bring you back to what happened in emerging markets. Emerging markets had underperformed developed markets by 25 percentage points in 2013. So from a valuation standpoint, we were finding lots of good ideas in emerging markets as 2013 was winding down and into the early part of 2014. This worked out very well in the beginning part of last year as emerging markets bottomed in February and had a very strong rebound relative to the uh, developed markets, including the U.S., uh, through the first half of the year. Uh, but then uh, we started to see some increased volatility, some more taper talk from the U.S. Fed and, uh, and global bond yields, yields fell, and that's when the real currency impact uh, really began. But we do, uh, we do recognize that we, we have a, a big overweight right now in emerging markets, lots of good ideas with good valuation support. We'll, get, we'll show you the valuation slide in a second, but very good valuation support on lots of our emerging market equities and uh, a very strong return on equity. And also on this page, two other regions to highlight, uh, one being <clears throat> United Kingdom, 
where we are about equal weight relative to the benchmark. Not a huge change last year, uh, but this is important because the UK, we're seeing uh, reasonably strong economic statistics. We're finding a lot of companies here that we believe can sustain those higher returns on equity and those higher valuations, and that's why we're about equal weight uh, within the UK. The, uh, the UK economic statistics are you know, almost in line with what's going on in the US. Very firm housing market, manufacturing indices uh, pointing north of 50, which is uh, indicating some growth in the UK. Unemployment coming down, so uh, a fairly similar picture to what's going on in the United States. But at the top of the page, uh, I want to talk about Japan briefly. Uh, Japanese equities have performed well in 2012 and 13, primarily driven by a depreciating yen, very, very strong uh, fiscal and monetary policy in place by the new um, uh, Abe administration, trying to break the back of a deflationary culture that has been in place for two decades. Um, we're finding more and more ideas in Japan. This, this used to be a very big underweight for all of our international portfolios. You can see we started the year 6% underweight. This used to be even more than that. Um, we're finding more ideas, more companies focused on improving return on equity in Japan. And this is not at all a top-down uh, uh, decision. We're not buying the big exporters of Nikon and Canon and Toyota and Honda simply because we have uh, a, a much lower yen and, and they, they're big exporters. We're buying companies like ASICS and Daikin and SoftBank and Don Quixote and Ryohin Kikeku. All these companies, most of them you probably have never heard of, but these are companies where we're finding uh, management teams that are focused on improving their return on equity, and we think the valuations uh, make a lot of sense given what those returns are. Uh, the next two pages show the portfolio as it stands at the end of the year. I want to skip over those, those details and get to uh, page 26 for the, the outlook. Uh, the top half of this page shows uh, general market outlook and the bottom being more of a, a corporate profitability outlook. Uh, certainly, we have slower growth within the Eurozone and Japan. Um, the difference this year with last year is that last year that wasn't priced in. Last year, markets were expecting earnings growth to catch up, uh, and, and we did not see that, which is why we saw uh, somewhat of a repricing of risk. This year, uh, a lot of that is priced in, and, and the focus is on can these regions and companies grow. Uh, geopolitical risks certainly remain. Greece, Russia, you know, did we have a, uh, a positive development last night with Russia uh, and, uh, and some European countries uh, uh, pushing through yet another ceasefire? We'll see if that holds. We don't we're not holding out a lot of hope that that ceasefire is going to hold, but at least it's a positive step. Uh, Greece certainly remains a wild card, and it's unfortunate because uh, despite 25% unemployment in Greece, things were getting better. Structural reforms that they had to in place, austerity uh, and, and other structural reforms, uh, we think, particularly within Greece, but also other peripheral nations, Spain, Ireland, Portugal, were improving uh, their economic statistics. Uh, over the past couple of years, uh, but now that uh, Syriza has won um, within uh, you know, the political arena in, in Greece, uh, it's a much more volatile environment, and the macro unfortunately has taken over uh, the stock specific. So the macro environment there is really dominating. Uh, additional ECB action, uh, we know it now. That's been the talk since September in terms of how big the quantitative easing will be and how liquid it will be, but now we know. January, the ECB announced uh, the sovereign debt component of their, um, of, of their uh, quantitative easing actions, uh, and they will begin buying that debt in March. Structural reform is the big next step for Japan. It will take a while, but the uh, administration is very focused on incenting companies for better corporate governance, for improved return on equity, and, uh, and actually uh, trying to force companies and incent them to uh, increase wages. That's really the next critical component in Japan. We need to see real wages increase 2-3% and 
We, ha we do have some positive inflation, which is a good thing from a deflationary culture for the past two decades, but we need real wages to increase. And the administration is now incenting companies with lower taxes to give out bigger bonuses. Again, trying to break that deflationary culture. Uh, emerging market valuations are attractive. I'll show you a slide on the next page, but patience there is certainly required. And from a corporate uh, standpoint, valuations are attractive in many uh, parts of non-US developed markets and emerging markets. Uh, and we're, we're going to see two pretty significant tailwinds this year from corporate profitability, the biggest one being currency translation. Last year, we had uh, a negative currency translation in the beginning quarter or so of 2014. And as the euro has depreciated 15% or so relative to the dollar, and the yen has continued to depreciate last year, also 12% or so relative to the dollar, we're going to see a pretty nice tailwind to corporate profit growth in Europe and Japan, certainly relative to the U.S. You've seen, uh, you know, we've, we've gone through the first earnings season in the U.S. this past couple of weeks, and we've seen a lot of big multinational companies start reducing their earnings expectations slightly for 2015 based on the strength of the dollar. So that... Are you focusing on exporters in those markets, or are we multinational? Uh, w within our portfolio, and this, this portfolio, it's really stock by stock. Uh, so we're not specifically targeting exporters, as I mentioned, with, with regards to Japan in particular. You know, we're not buying those companies, necessarily buying uh, Toyota, Honda, the big uh, go-to exporters. We may, uh, but right now we're finding lots of other companies. Some do have uh, 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 portions of the company with, with significant exports, uh, but it's really a stock-by-stock -stock basis. Uh, but broadly speaking, this uh, tailwind for currency translation should help uh, the Eurozone and uh, Japan. Addi additionally, uh, the, the lower energy prices will certainly help. These are big importing uh, regions, Japan, Europe, U.S., obviously big uh, importers. U.S. not so much anymore, obviously, but uh, that, that should be a pretty nice tailwind for, for consumption. And corporate balance sheets are, remain very strong in Europe and Japan, uh, so that's a positive. But we remain focused on stocks and, and try to eliminate the macro and political risks as much as we possibly can because they're very difficult to quantify. Next page, uh, two pages really show the valuation and returns of different regions. Uh, the first one here being that I want to highlight on page 27 is Japan. Uh, I mentioned some, some reforms going on in Japan. Japanese equities at 15 times earnings. This is really the first time we've seen Japanese valuations as a region within spitting distance of uh, other developed nations. We've seen Japanese equities 20, 30 times earnings over the past two decades. So the valuation component is more attractive. But given the level of ROE you get at 8.8%, uh, that valuation, some would argue, is stretched. But we think there remains potential for returns in Japan, as I mentioned earlier, to continue improving. So as companies continue focusing on this, we have our analysts and portfolio managers. Many of them have, have visited our Japanese companies in Japan over the past several months, and, and folks keep coming back saying they're focused on the right things. We're, we, we should see continuing Im improvement uh, in ROE. So uh, we're cautiously optimistic there. The UK, as I mentioned from an economic standpoint, is uh, reasonably sound and you're getting a, a relatively cheap valuation and decent uh, returns on equity in the UK. Uh, continental Europe, you really need to peel apart the onion. You've got, Japan, uh, you've got uh, Germany, France, and Italy, which are really the core of continental Europe, and then you have the periphery. I mentioned the improvement uh, in the periphery. These are folks that took on many structural reforms uh, because of the European debt crisis, and things are improving, partly because you're coming off of a low base, but partly due to those structural reforms. Uh, Germany is okay, uh, but as I mentioned earlier, the, the growth expectations were a little bit too high in 2014. Those expectations have, we hope, been fully reset. But uh, Germany, 50% of the German GDP is export related. So as long as the US and China uh, uh, continue growing, which we think that they will, 
uh, that should be good for German exports. Uh, France and Italy, flat as a pancake, and we, and we really need uh, some structural reforms to be, uh, to be initiated there, and uh, you know, that, that remains a, a very long-term project. And emerging markets, 12 times earnings is cheap, but you want it, you know, emerging markets should be cheap relative to developed markets because of political uncertainty, corporate governance risks, uh, but you're getting a pretty solid return pattern there, which does grow, so uh, positive on emerging markets. And finally, I want to bring you to, I think, what is <clears throat> one of the more critical slides of the whole deck here on page 37, which is the currency chart. So this is the big driver as we started out this, uh, this conversation. What this chart shows is the currency impact to the EFI and ACWI benchmarks over the past 20 years. So it takes the, the benchmarks in local currency and applies what the currency did. So you see that over time, there's a, a dark line here in the middle, which shows that uh, the, the long-term currency impact is effectively zero. Literally, that line is on zero. Uh, what we saw last year was one of the most significant currency impacts, uh, negative currency impacts that we've seen over the past 20 years. So we're looking back here on the full year, last 12 months currency impact, every quarter going back 20 years. So we have 80 data points here, and the data point from the end of December 2014 indicates that that negative 10% currency impact that we saw to U.S. dollar-based portfolios was one of the top five that we've seen in the past 20 years. We don't have a prediction whether or not this is going to continue. My point here being a lot is priced into the market. The currency has taken a very significant hit, uh, both the euro and the yen. The strong dollar uh, really dominated the conversation last year. But this is really important. What will be the transmission mechanism for the ECB quantitative easing? that is about to start from a, you know, as, as they start buying sovereign debt in March. Let's think about what the transmission mechanism was for the U.S. Fed. The U.S. Fed in, in QE3 bought $1.6 trillion in mortgages and treasuries. Their intent was to lower the rate on mortgages, lower the rates on treasuries, and incent people to buy houses, refinance, and we, we saw that effect in the economy. Housing market firmed and improved quite substantially, and we saw all sorts of ripple effects from the housing market. Unemployment improved, and all, all the uh, uh, various industries that support the housing market also improved. The transmission mechanism in Europe and Japan will be quite a bit different in their quantitative easing. It will be the currency. So we've been talking about quantitative easing in, in Europe for at least six months. In fact, quantitative easing was brought into uh, or, or became a reality in September when uh, the ECB started buying asset-backed securities and covered bonds, which is a fairly illiquid market. They really couldn't move the needle too much. But with bond yields near zero and spreads on things like mortgages very, very tight, the transmission mechanism here is not going to be through lowering rates. It's going to be through the currency. So by depreciating the currency, since we started quantitative easing in, uh, in the fall of 2014, and then we had the, the bigger move of quantitative easing on the sovereign component uh, announced in January, we've seen this big 15 or so percent move down in the euro. That makes European companies more competitive on a global basis. Will we see an immediate change to economic growth? Probably not, but with more than a trillion dollars of ECB support through the next 18 or 19 months. That should be supportive of equities. And this, the, the lower currency should help uh, uh, augment uh, corporate profits and hopefully incent some growth uh, within the companies. So that's it for the, the uh, formal part of the presentation. I'd, I'd be happy to answer questions. Any board members have any questions? Go ahead, Ken. If the uh, southern half of Europe drops out of the euro, how would that affect you guys? Certainly, we'd have uh, a, a tremendous amount of volatility. 
Greece is, is, is really the, the, the poster child for this. So it's, it's not in anybody's interest to see a Greek exit from, from the euro. Uh, political risk will be paramount in, in Europe this year. Uh, with Greece uh, doing uh, what they're doing with, with Syriza, that brings into play uh, a, a left-wing party called Podemos in Spain. Spanish elections are, are uh, at the end of this year, and they have been polling a lot stronger uh, as of recent because of what they saw in, in Greece. Uh, but we will see some resolution uh, to the, uh, the, the, what's going on in Greece. If Greece were to leave by itself, uh, from an economic standpoint, that wouldn't be a big deal. But it's the knock-on effect to Spain and, and the other countries that would, that would uh, uh, impact the volatility. So certainly uh, there would be more volatility uh, to currency and to uh, the companies. But again, it's, for us, it's all about finding the stocks. And we think we'd be able to generate relative performance even in a, a more volatile environment. Any other questions? Thank you Thanks, very much. Sir. Appreciate it. Is our next presenter here? Well, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, we've got about 30 minutes, so uh, you can do it. Break it however you want to do. If you want questions asked during your presentation, that's fine. Or if you want to wait till the end, however you want to do it. Sure. Uh, I'll lead off with a firm update and then uh, hand off to Brian. Uh, we can take okay. questions All right, at sir. the conclusion of the firm update. So uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting us uh, to present to you today and to provide an update on your investment in the uh, harding Lubner International Equity Strategy. Uh, my name is Jason Salerno. I am a manager of the firm's institutional client management team. And I have been with Harding Levener for eight years. Uh, I'm joined by Brian Lloyd, who is an international equity portfolio manager as well as a financial services research analyst. And in his capacity as a portfolio manager, Brian works closely with Alec Roll, uh, sorry, Alec Walsh and Farrell Roll, who are the strategy's co-lead portfolio managers. And Alec and Farrell have been co-managing the strategy together since 2010, and they have been members of the portfolio management team on international equity for over 10 years. So if you please turn to the first page of your book, uh, you can find my and Brian's bios, as well as the uh, table of contents. So as I mentioned, I'll lead off with a brief firm overview before handing off to Brian to discuss our investment philosophy, uh, portfolio performance, structure, and our outlook uh, for this year. Uh, moving on to the next page, uh, I know it has been a few years since we've spoken to you last, so I'd like to just take a moment to remind you of Harding Lovner's approach to investing. Um, at Harding Lovner, we build concentrated, diversified portfolios of high quality, growing companies identified through bottom up fundamental research. Uh, this is the investment philosophy 
that our firm has employed uh, consistently across our 25-year history. Uh, we celebrated our 25th anniversary last year, uh, and it is also the philosophy that we employ across all five of our investment strategies. And Brian will go into more detail uh, on our philosophy in just a moment. Turning to the next page, um, I'd like to highlight that uh, our firm is located in Bridgewater, New Jersey, which is an hour west of New York City. Uh, we are an 86-person firm at current, and 33 of those uh, individuals are investment professionals, uh, and that figure is inclusive of our research analysts and portfolio managers, as well as our chief investment officer, Simon Hallett, and our trading personnel, which, uh, which are three individuals. Uh, the portfolio management team for international equity is deeply experienced with uh, 14 years average tenure at the firm across the five gentlemen, uh, which uh, you can see all five listed on page 33 of this presentation, as well as in the um, paper clipped portion at the back. Uh, just moving down on this page, uh, we are a $38 uh, billion firm of the $38 billion in assets under management. Uh, 16 billion of those are uh, owed to clients in the international equity strategy. And you can see the full breakdown um, of our AUM, both by investment strategy as well as by client domicile uh, in the two pie charts on this page. Um, and uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions about the firm or I can hand over to Brian. All right, thank you. Again, thanks very much for uh, receiving us this morning. Um, I will pick up on uh, page seven of the packet. And please uh, stop me uh, if you have any questions. I'd be happy to take uh, questions at any point. Um, this is perhaps uh, one of the most important slides in, in the deck, and it really speaks to who we are as a firm and our investment philosophy. Um, what it does is it compares various metrics for our international portfolio compared to the index, uh, the Morgan Stanley um, all country world X U S. So the index is represented by the blue bars. The red bars are represented by the Harding Lovner portfolio. On the left hand side of the page, you'll see various quality metrics. So profit margin, return on assets, return on equity, uh, debt to equity, which ref reflects leverage, and uh, the standard deviation of ROE or the, the uh, volatility in returns. And you'll see that on every metric. Uh, the harding Lovner portfolio exceeds that of the, the index. Uh, and this is really speaks to um, our, our promise to you that we're going to deliver to you a, a portfolio of high-quality growth companies. On the right-hand right -hand side of the chart, you'll see uh, four different metrics representing growth, uh, in this case sales growth, earnings growth, cash flow growth, and even dividend growth, which is a metric we don't specifically target uh, for our companies, but it does somewhat represent um, a measure of quality, or I'm, I'm sorry, of, of growth. And again, you'll notice that uh, the, the statistics for the Harding Lovner portfolio do exceed uh, by a substantial margin that of the index. So again, this is more or less a proof statement that we're doing what we said we were going to do, which is to deliver a portfolio of high quality growth companies. Uh, we tend to show this slide on, on every time we, we present an update on the, on the, the firm or the, or the individual strategies. Um, and I would suggest if you ever see a slide that does not look like this, you would, should consider firing us, quite frankly. Flipping the page now to page eight, which gives a summary of our investment performance. Um, I would focus. Okay, yes. Back to page seven. Can you just sure. also discuss the types of periods where this is beneficial and types of periods where you may lag because of this? Yes, um, and there's a uh, one in the following slides. There is um, some information that will address that, but I can certainly answer the question. Um, we typically tend to underperform, and it's important to note that this strategy. Uh, quality growth is not going to outperform under every market condition. Uh, where we tend to underperform would be during so-called junk rallies, where lesser quality companies tend to, to rally um, uh, at the bottom of a cycle, perhaps. We saw this um, in primarily, uh, most recently, last January, where there was a bit of optimism about uh, re returning growth uh, amid uh, the Eurozone and some of the lower quality banks, those that were, quite frankly, on the ropes, uh, did rebound quite a bit. We did underperform uh, in January of last year uh, as a result of that sentiment shift. Um, but it was temporary, and we did, uh, uh, as you'll see on, on page eight, we did uh, return a, um, a uh, favorable result for you in the last 12 months. I don't know if that 
addresses your, your question. Okay. Uh, so again, on page eight, um, and I'm focusing now on the last 12 months, I'd be happy to talk about the last quarter as well, but um, I, I assume you'd prefer to hear uh, a bit more about uh, the full year in 2014. Um, gross of fees and net of fees, um, we were a little disappointed in that we weren't able to deliver to you a positive return for the year, uh, but we do take solace in, in the fact that uh, we did outperform uh, the index by nearly uh, 3%. Um, you'll also see some of the past uh, performance measures for three years, five years, and ten years, and at the far right hand of the slide, you'll see our performance uh, since inception of your account. Uh, page nine gets a little bit. Uh, sorry, just that's since inception of the strategy. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, of the strategy. My, my mistake. Um, on page nine, uh, it gets into a little bit of what I had just recently mentioned. Um, it speaks to uh, some of the he headwinds or tailwinds that we tend to see with uh, our quality uh, growth strategy. So if I just look at um, the upper left-hand chart, what it shows is um, four quintiles showing the best quality growth companies all the way down to the worst quality growth companies, and the bars represent their performance. So what we saw in 2014 and in the last quarter was what we would hope to see being uh, the best quality uh, growth company, I'm sorry, the best quality companies actually outperform the least quality growth companies. That's what we tend to see over time, but it doesn't happen every, every period. And in fact, in 2013, we saw the opposite. In, in many cases, uh, companies were being, lesser quality companies were being rewarded by generating earnings growth by buying back shares, or perhaps uh, the companies that had high dividend yields, like utilities companies, which tend to not grow and can often be um, uh, lesser quality companies. Uh, but in 2014, we saw things uh, moving to what we would expect to see over the long term. Uh, in other words, the market rewarding high quality growth companies. And you saw that um, not only in the fourth quarter, but in the trailing 12 months, both when you look at, when you break down the market in terms of quality, which is on the left side of this page, and then growth on the right side of this page. Page 10 gets into the trailing 12 month performance by sector and by region. So last year, um, as you might expect, some of the more defensive sectors, uh, healthcare, information technology, uh, even utilities outperformed. Uh, those are the only three sectors that were positively, uh, that pr positively performed during the year. Utilities, it was most likely due to the market's need for yield. Um, those companies certainly do not grow very well, but they do consistently deliver yield, and, and so they're viewed in, in a somewhat defensive nature. And then not surprisingly, at the bottom of the page, uh, commodity sectors, uh, materials, and energy uh, were the, the worst performing sectors in the year. On a regional basis, um, I would draw your attention to the fact that the Middle East, uh, as we display it here, uh, was a big outperformer. However, uh, the Middle East is represented by only one country, Israel, and within Israel, it's really one uh, company, Teva Pharmaceuticals, that dominates. So this is largely uh, not a very meaningful um, uh, representation here. So I would. Uh, ignore uh, the Middle East as a contributor. Mainly what we're looking at is um, uh, some of the, the fact that most regions underperformed, um, the most recently or most, uh, most importantly, uh, the European Monetary Union at the bottom of the slide due to concerns about growth uh, and the ability of the ECB to generate inflation and, and to essentially uh, improve the banking system, restructure the banking system. That's certainly the outlook for that definitely deteriorated over the period of the year, and that led to some significant underperformance for that region. On page 11, uh, goes into a little bit more detail on the attribution. Um, the height of the bars represents outperformance or, or underperformance, and I can go through in some detail in terms of uh, what companies and what types of companies outperformed or underperformed. So taking first the top part of the, the slide, looking at sector, uh, within financials, we had um, strong outperformance, mainly due to ICICI and other emerging market banks. Within healthcare, companies like Sysmex, companies that have recurring revenue streams or uh, treat um, conditions that tend to be more recurring, such as dialysis, uh, cancer, um, um, even uh, neurological diseases like uh, Alzheimer's, companies that, that tend to serve those, um, those uh, end markets uh, definitely did outperform for us. And even within materials, even though the group underperformed, um, our companies within materials such as Air Liquide and Fuchs Petrolube, which is an um, industrial lubricant manufacturer, 
Um, those companies outperformed extremely well. Uh, we don't have any mining or any steel stocks in the portfolio, so that definitely helped us um, during the year. Within consumer staples, Unicharm was probably one of our largest outperformers of the year. They are a, a, a Japanese-based maker of um, adult diapers and infant diapers, uh, and they export to lots of markets, most importantly China, which is a, a big driver for them. On the negative side, consumer discretionary lost value for us throughout the year, mainly due to the decline in luxury goods sales in China. Um, so, so Swatch, uh, the, the watchmaker, and Sands China, which is uh, the number one um, uh, gaming company in Macau, um, they were the primary underperformers for us there. And, and the, the theme resounding through that was uh, uh, the decline in, in uh, luxury spending in China. With information technology, uh, SAP was the major uh, weak point uh, in the year on, within that sector. SAP is, is sort of in the middle of a product cycle, we feel. Um, so we feel that uh, we're sticking with the company. We think uh, as they transition to a cloud-based platform, uh, their growth and their margins are going to improve going forward, whereas the market seems to be treating them as if they, they won't rebound and they won't uh, recover from this product cycle. If you go back several years, the same thing happened during previous product cycle transitions, so we think it's likely to happen again, and we're sticking with the company. We feel the management has a good handle on what's happening. And then within industrials, JGC, uh, and this somewhat ties into the, the energy theme, uh, JGC is a manufacturer of, uh, and designer of liquid natural gas plants. So as oil prices and gas prices declined, uh, the market tended to penalize them, but we feel strongly that they, uh, uh, they have a durable competitive advantage, and in fact, they did recently win uh, a new uh, mandate. So we feel that the, the company is in, in safe hands. As far as regional attribution, um, within emerging markets, again, it was primarily the banks uh, in India, Itaú, in Brazil, Garantee in uh, Turkey that led the way for us. Uh, and Pacific, ex excluding Japan, um, AIA, the uh, life insurer based out of Hong Kong, and CSL, the pharmaceutical company in Australia, were the, the big outperformers. Again, in Japan, it was Unicharm that led the way. And then in Europe, uh, excluding the European Monetary Union, um, BG Group, which is a, um, the old British gas um, energy producer, Swatch, and Tesco, the, um, um, uh, the uh, UK-based uh, retailer, were the primary detractors of value. So I'll skip over the next two pages. They relate to the fourth quarter attribution and positioning, which uh, the themes are very similar to the, uh, uh, the full year number. So I'd be happy to address that. But um, again, it's somewhat repetitive. So moving now on to page 14, which discusses some of the most recent purchases and, and sales uh, in the, the, the portfolio. And I point over here again that our turnover tends to be very low. Um, we'd spent a lot of time uh, doing bottom-up fundamental work on our companies. Uh, it could take several months before an analyst um, uh, starts working on a company, building up a, a, a base. Uh, we often meet with management teams multiple times before we can get comfortable enough that a company meets our criteria. So our, our turnover, likewise, is it tends to be on the low end. Uh, the trailing five-year average in this case is 15.7%. So it's typical that you wouldn't see many new purchases or many sales from us uh, during a quarter or even during a year. In this case, um, one of the positions that we recently bought is Linda out of Germany. Uh, they're one of the three major industrial gas companies in the world. Um, one of the things that we like about them is what they've done is they've recently purchased uh, at a quite reasonable price a home health care company, which has, uh, at, uh, it has a lot of um, uh, trans translation. It translates well to their core industrial gas business. So it relates to home health care, uh, providing oxygen, other base uh, gases to people um, in a recurring way so that uh, uh, the business uh, is not quite as cyclical as you would expect it to be given that it's tied to industrial gases. So we see a lot of synergy between their base business and what this home health care business that they acquired can do. And then Shire Pharmaceuticals is a name that we've known for, for quite a long time. Um, they uh, have a terrific R&D background, a, a pipeline that we, we feel very good about in terms of where the, um, where the money is being spent and how efficiently it's, it's being spent. So we followed the company for a long time. However, during part of the year, the company was potentially going to be acquired by AbbVie. Um, so the stock price ran up uh, tremendously and, and looked extremely expensive to us. Um, and part of that transaction was due to uh, some of the tax inversion. Um, uh, it was kind of a wave of, of uh, tax inversion M&A based uh, um, actions by many companies who were looking to relocate 
uh, and take advantage of tax rules uh, elsewhere outside of the U.S. So when the U.S. started to put pressure on this deal, uh, AbbVie ev eventually abandoned uh, the acquisition of Shire. Stock price dropped tremendously, and it got down to a point where we felt uh, it made much sense to buy it on a standalone basis, and we did step in and bought it uh, um, after we felt that the valuation was extremely reasonable. As far as positions sold, uh, Cochlear was a name that worked out extremely well for us. Uh, they're a manufacturer of, um, uh, of advanced hearing aids, so the aging theme uh, plays into, comes into play tremendously there. Uh, we did sell that position based on valuation. Um, the stock really had, had uh, run up beyond where we thought uh, a reasonable level of valuation was, and we, we, uh, we sold the position. And then ENN Energy is a fairly uh, recent purchase uh, in the fund, however, we found out that there was a uh, related party transaction between um, some members of the management team and their families. Um, corporate governance is something that we take very uh, seriously, and we have a, a detailed set of checklists that goes through um, many of the key points within corporate governance that we feel are important. And in this case, we felt they violated uh, one of these areas, and we, we took the opportunity to sell it when we saw evidence of, uh, of the corporate governance weakness. Uh, page 15 deals with uh, transitions in terms of uh, how our sector performance, I'm sorry, our sector positioning has changed over the year. And you'll notice that there's not a lot of movement. Um, perhaps uh, within materials, that, that's where you'd see the largest change, and that was um, some additions to Air Liquide, uh, another industrial gas manufacturer, and Fuchs Petroloop, uh, the German-based uh, lubricants, industrial lubricants manufacturer. And again, regional base, uh, not a lot of changes uh, throughout the year, which is, is largely what you would expect from us, given our low uh, turnover. Pardon me. And on page 16, uh, this goes through our end weights, where our, our current positioning stands. Um, we're currently overweight information technology, healthcare, and consumer staples. This, is, this tends to be where we find uh, the most high-quality growth companies. Um, I, I'd stress at this point that we don't make any major factor bets. So we don't specifically target these, these sectors. It just, ha it just so happens our bottom, up, uh, our bottom up fundamental work tends to drive us towards sectors such as this. And likewise, um, industries like utilities, very low growth companies, uh, telecom services, highly volatile, and financials especially, um, it's very difficult for us to find a good amount of high quality financial services companies to invest in. So it's not unlikely that you'd see us uh, underweight in financials, as you see here. Regional-wise, um, I, I would take these, uh, these expressions with a, a, a grain of salt, given that we don't target industries or, uh, or regions. So to look at uh, the overweight that we have in the European Monetary Union, we're not making a statement about what we think is going to happen to the Europe European Monetary Union. Rather, we, we like many of the companies that are based there. However, in most cases, so companies like Allianz, L'Oreal, or BMW, uh, they may be located there, but they derive a lot of their revenues from other developed markets and emerging markets as well. So I wouldn't take this as a, as a, as a reference to us saying we, we were favorable on the European Monetary Union. It just so happens that many of our companies are, are located there. On the bottom side, um, we have an underweight to emerging markets, which is an area that we do, uh, we do like. Uh, however, um, with a 22% um, weighting in the benchmark, um, fairly sizable. Uh, we do have a, what we feel is a, is a good um, weighting in emerging markets at about 15%, and it's slightly increased over time. But we still do remain a little bit underweight, that group. At the bottom of the page, you'll see our top 10 holdings, which comprise about 32% of the fund. So we are generating a somewhat concentrated portfolio. And then along those lines, on the following page, on page 17, you'll see our overall risk constraints. There's a lot of numbers on this page, so I won't go through it in, in uh, excessive detail. But in general, uh, there's really no science to all of this. What we're trying to do is deliver a diversified portfolio. So we set forth some common sense guidelines. Uh, for instance, we want to be in a minimum number of markets, uh, 15 different markets. Uh, we want to make sure we're in at least seven sectors. Um, we have limits in terms of um, what, how much we can have in one industry. Uh, and various geographic limits, which we feel are more or less common sense kind of uh, measures to keep make sure that we're uh, delivering a uh, diversified portfolio. So there's no real science behind any of this. The following page goes through some of our basic portfolio statistics, which is somewhat uh, 
uh, somewhat repetitive um, from some of the earlier slides. Um, we have uh, higher than average returns on equity, um, returns on assets, uh, below le average leverage, et cetera. Um, the number of companies in the, in the portfolio now stands at 53. Um, typically what you'd find for us is, given that we do present a, a high quality growth portfolio, it does come at a price. So typically uh, some of the more standard uh, valuation multiples like price to book, price to earnings, we tend to be above the index. So uh, the quality and growth does come at a price, but given the valuation work we do, in addition to looking at multiples, we feel we're getting it at a very good, uh, good value overall. So at that point, um, I will stop for questions. The, the rest of the slides deal with, uh, lays out some of the details on what, we, what our holdings are uh, and a few other uh, details as well, but I'd be happy to take any questions at this point. Any board members have any questions? Nothing, sir. You did a good, you did a good job. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Okay. Item three is approve the minutes of the meeting of January eighth, twenty fifteen. Motion been made. Are there a second? All those in favor, signify by aye. Opposed, same sign. Eyes have it. Item four, there's two items, so let's do them separately. First is uh, item A, receive the report of uh, judgment, purchase of the judgment. Motion been made, are there a second? All those in favor signify by aye. Opposed, same sign, eyes have. B is our comprehensive annual financial report. Renee, would you like to talk to us about the GASB 67 uh, in, in the report that shows the value at 110 percent or is it 101 percent? Which is it? Well, it's both. GASB 67 <laughs> requires that we present the actuarial valuations based upon market value of assets, not the smooth value of assets we do during when we perform our regular valuation. Also, the date is as of June 30, 2014, so it shows we're 110 percent of market value but based upon our actuarial valuation, which is the four-year smooth, we're at the 101 point, whatever, close, closer to 102. Okay. And so we're, we're going to try to work with accounting. We're going to check with, or we're just going to check with the auditors. Only because of the transparency, they may not let us because they want everything to relate to the 67. And we've put another number in there. It may be too confusing for the reader. So we'll have to review and see what we can do and, and what kind of notes we can put in. But that will be the, their call. On the actuarial, we only list our smoothed because it says a plan year. No. But not as of, it's, it's different valuations. We're not using the June 30. Right. It, it, on their notes, they do have, if, if you do have a market value as of December 31st, it, it, it's on there. But of course, the valuation we use is a different year than the current value, the right. current CAFR. 31st in Jul July. December 31st yeah. versus June 30, right. Yeah. And then also the management letter that was inserted into your book is evidently not ours. It's uh, Lake Atoka. So if you have that, you can disregard that and you can shred that and they will be giving sure. us our correct management letter. And, and Renee, when did you say we'll, we'll have our actual report that it's It will be closer to June. Okay. It's, it's, Okay. Uh, we need a motion to approve that. Motion been made and seconded. All those in favor signify by aye. Opposed, same sign, ayes have it. Item five is ratify the approval of the payroll for the month of January 2015. Motion been made or there a second. All those in favor signify by aye. Opposed, same sign, ayes have it. Item six is approve the claims docket. Motion been made. Are there a second? All those in favor signify by aye. Opposed, same sign. Ayes have it. Item uh, seven is approve the following applications for service retirement, and we have five. Are there a second? All those in favor signify by aye. Opposed, same sign. Ayes have it. Item eight is receive the report of death and approve the continuation of pensions to the spouse. And there are two items. Motion been made or there a second? 
All those in favor signify by aye. Opposed, same sign, ayes have it. Item 9 is received, reported death, and authorized the payment of $5,000 death benefit and authorized the Secretary to make the necessary changes to conform to the following. Motion be made or there a second? All those in favor signify by aye. Opposed, same sign, ayes have it. Item 10 is received, reported death, and authorized the Secretary to make the necessary changes to conform to the following. All those in favor signify by aye. Opposed, same sign, ayes have it. Item 11 is received reported death and authorize the payment of the death benefit and approve the continuation of the pension to the spouse. Motion been made. Second. All those in favor signify by aye. Opposed, same sign, ayes have it. Item 12 is received reported death and the death of the employee while in active service and approve the pension to the spouse. Motion been made and seconded. All those in favor signify by aye. Opposed, same sign, ayes have it. Item 13 is ratify of approval of the following termination of vested rights and receive a lump sum payment of their employee contribution account. Motion been made or there a second. All those in favor signify by aye. Opposed, same sign, ayes have it. I think it would have been. That was what, the, but when they originally vested, that was what their pension amount was. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Item uh, 14 is discussed or authorized sending attendees to the NCPERS trustee and annual conference in May the 2nd through the 7th in New Orleans. Motion been made. Are there a second? All those in favor signify by aye. Oh, same sign, eyes have it. If you want to go, uh, be sure and get with Renee and get that lined up. Uh, item uh, 15 is uh, investment consultant report. Jake, you're on, sir. Thanks. I, I handed out the monthly January report, the, the end of year quarterly report, and then uh, just a, for your information, an item that says year in review. I won't go through that. That year in review is just our uh, review of the capital markets and the economy uh, for your reading pleasure. There's some good things in there. I saw Jim looking at the what we call the quilt chart, uh, which shows over the last, I think probably goes back 15 years, the best performing asset class per year and the worst performing asset class per year. I think that's a good chart to uh, look at from time to time just to remind you why you're diversified, why we don't get in love with one asset class just because it did well. Uh, or why do we don't move away from an asset class because it did poorly in a particular year because things change uh, very rapidly from year to year. You have a plan uh, to, to allocate your assets in such a way that you're comfortable with the level of risk you're taking and you have a reasonable likelihood of achieving your objectives over time. This last year, calendar year 2014, if you just turn to page six in your, your quarterly book, focus on the, the middle column, really was not a great year for diversification. Uh, the more diversified you were, I don't want to say you did poorly, but uh, the less diversified you were, particularly as a U.S. investor, if you were focused on U.S. large cap stocks and U.S. investment grade bonds, uh, the better you did. If you look in that one year column, that gold bar in the middle represents the S&P 500, so U.S. large cap stocks, uh, did significantly better than all other asset classes. U.S. large cap stocks up almost a little over 13.5 percent. You know, the next best asset class was the Barclays Ag or U.S. investment grade bonds, and that was primarily treasuries, surprisingly, up about almost 6 percent. If you think back to the beginning of 2014, you certainly weren't doing this, but I had a lot of clients uh, asking, why are we still in bonds? Yields are at 3 percent. Uh, should we get out of our bonds and move into other things? And the answer is always, I mean, from a risk standpoint, the risk of bonds is, in any one month or in any one year is uh, 10 to 20 times less than the risk of stocks, and that's the purpose of having bonds. And we can't predict what's going to happen. In, the, in 2014, we saw interest rates go from above 3 to below 2. 
uh, on the 10-year Treasury, which really pushed up bond prices, and particularly U.S. Treasuries. So there was this massive flight to quality. The dollar appreciated uh, at the same time, which had a big headwind to U.S. investors investing outside the U.S. The two managers certainly talked about that. As you look at the uh, EFI benchmark down four and a half, the emerging market ben benchmark down close to two, and then commodities, as we as we know, energy prices dropped dramatically. Commodities down 17 percent. Uh, you have a small allocation to commodities that was funded in October of last year. We still believe longer term the diversification benefits of that are appropriate, but it's also why it's a small allocation. It's very volatile uh, over time. Uh, just as we, your portfolio actually did fairly well on a, on a relative basis. A um, couple of things, even within the small cap, the both of your managers are SMID, small to mid, and so by having that ability for those managers to go up a little bit in market cap, it was a little bit better than being in pure small cap because the larger the, the portfolio, the higher the market cap in the portfolio, the better the, uh, the, the, better the portfolio did. So overall, uh, on a one-year basis, um, portfolio was up uh, about 6.5%. Seven three percent. Um, I will tell you. I don't know if you all saw me scrambling during Lazard's presentation. Our, our report has a, an error in it. Uh, we missed a capital gain distribution in Lazard's mutual fund that was reinvested in December. So we underreported their uh, their performance by about three um, percent. Their what they were reporting in their book is correct. What's, what's in our book is, is, is incorrect. That's on the one year. So they're about a 4% weight. We'll, we'll restate the books. That, that'll add probably somewhere between 5 and 10 basis points to the, to the total return. It's, it's a small amount, but it will, will have some impact. I was looking at that saying there's definitely something wrong there. And I, uh, it was a capital gain distribution that happened in, in December, and it was reinvested. So we took the NAV, and didn't, it, we just were showing that it was reduced. So apologize for that. Uh, but overall, the uh, portfolio ranks in the top uh, well above median in the 46th percentile uh, over that one-year one period. As, as you know, the, the risk in the portfolio is substantially less than the risk of your uh, policy index over time, page 21 in the upper right, we show this is going back now uh, 13 full years. So the return of the portfolio, uh, while over that 0.13-year measurement period, a little bit under, it's a 1% under your 7%, you've got still the bad part of the early 2000s and then 2008 in there, uh, but the, the risk of the portfolio substantially less, which is what we would uh, expect. And with 101, whether it's 101 or 110 percent funding, uh, one of the things we want to be cognizant of is maintaining that balance between your assets and, and your liabilities. And when you're closer to 100 percent funded, you don't necessarily need to take on as much risk. Uh, you want to maintain, you want to protect uh, when markets go down. I think the way your portfolio constructed is certainly appropriate. Just looking at the, the January ASAP, because I, uh, while I said diversification really didn't help in 2013, uh, you take, you add a month, and really now looking at one-year numbers, taking away a month of last January, really making one-year numbers for the uh, managers look uh, surprisingly better on a relative basis. Uh, Harding Levener mentioned it, that when I asked about what periods of time their portfolio wouldn't perform as well, it's periods that lower quality outperforms uh, or higher quality underperforms. Well, January of last year was a period when high quality underperformed. If you just look, uh, and that theme of high quality, uh, you're, you're high, you have a lot of high quality growth managers in your portfolio, Harding Levner. Uh, Von Tobel on the emerging market side, Wasatch on the emerging market side. If we look back a month, the, their one-year returns didn't look as good. Both Wasatch and uh, Von Tobel were above the benchmark. But now, Harding-Levner, the end of 
January, their one-year return is 7.34 relative to the benchmark up one. So 600 basis points of excess return. Most of that is while they had a, a good month up one and a half percent when the benchmark was down 13, it's taking off that bad month of January. But I point that out just because we're very time period specific when you look at an endpoint, but also recognizing with active managers, you're going to go through periods of time where they where they're not outperforming, where they may look different than the benchmark. Over long periods of time, we think you have managers that can generate excess return. The other thing uh, that's certainly nice to see uh, in terms of diversification, uh, just highlight the, the long short equity. Your long short equity over the last three months, so this would be November, December, and January, which were difficult months in the U.S. equity markets, particularly November and January. Your large cap, Managers are down, your small cap managers are down, long short equity is up almost 3% uh, over that period when U.S. equities are actually negative. So that, you know, it's designed to provide protection uh, in down markets and actually now it's adding, we wouldn't necessarily always expect it to be positive in a, in a down market, but over this period of time, uh, certainly that, that's benefiting. Uh, so for the year, uh, Really now, looking at, at the active managers, large cap, in tech, they've added about 1.5%. Times Square a little bit behind uh, over that one-year period, but certainly making up for that is earnest on, on the value side. They've outperformed by, by 4%. Your international managers, uh, two of which were just here, they, they are really being additive uh, in a period of time where international markets haven't done, done so well. Von Tobel up 17, over 17%. Uh, the last year, the emerging market benchmark up 5.6. Go back a month, now we just looked at the end of the year numbers, the emerging market benchmark was negative. So you've seen a bit of a turnaround uh, there as well. A lot of that has, uh, they've benefited from their exposure to India. India has been a very good performing market for them. Uh, and on the fixed income side, certainly your bonds did uh, well in a period of time where, where bonds rallied, primarily treasuries. Having a little bit more plus uh, wasn't necessary, meaning high yield bank loans or other things wasn't necessarily a positive. Brandywine had an outstanding year. Uh, as we look across our, our client base and a lot of the, uh, non, uh, the non dollar bond managers that our clients are using, Brandywine certainly stands out. Uh, Brandywine is primarily investing in, in sovereign debt. This, this strategy is uh, their oppor global opportunistic strategy, so they can also invest in the U.S. They don't have to just be outside of the U.S. Where they benefited was they had significant exposure to the dollar in U.S. Treasuries, and they had a little bit longer duration. So as interest rates came down, they really benefited from that. They avoided some of the currencies that were hardest hit. They had negative exposure to Europe and negative exposure to Japan. Uh, so that diversification there really uh, helped uh, within their portfolio. And as you think about this as a complement or an extension of your fixed income, it's very good performance in a, in a year where, where bonds, U.S. bonds did fine, up 6%, but this, this even added a little bit more value. PAMCO, a little bit more of a struggle. You had more uh, within the long short credit space period of time where Bond prices were going up. They have a lot of short credit exposure there that, that did, didn't did quite do as well. It was getting hit the, the other way. But overall, that was certainly a positive. Then finally, within the, the real estate, the Morgan Stanley strategy continues to do well. Of the open-end core real estate funds, Morgan Stanley uh, uh, looks a little bit different. They tend to have carry a little bit more leverage in their portfolio. They do a, a few things. Uh, don't want to, they're not taking on development risk per se, but they are doing some non-benchmark things like hotels, self-storage uh, that have been additive, uh, and then their multifamily or apartment uh, component was, was very additive uh, for them over the last year, and they're up 14% uh, for, the, for the year. Commodities, like I said, you have, have that for a quarter. The Gresham strategy was basically down in line with the commodities uh, benchmark. But all in all, one year numbers now through the end of uh, January, the, the fund is up 8.34% over that one year period, uh, well ahead of the policy index, which is up 788, three years up 11 and a quarter, 
five years, the fund is up to over 10% per year annualized through the end of January, so still a relatively good five-year period. Uh, with respect to, to managers, no uh, issues of concern at, at this point. Um, one thing I'm just looking at in terms of allocation, you're essentially uh, in line with targets, about 1% overweight to equity overall, 2% overweight to fixed income, but your real assets are still underweight as the opportunistic real estate hasn't completely been filled out. Or, or um, So no real rebalancing needs at the major, at the broad asset class level, but within equities, small caps have, have run up a little bit. Um, I'm not sure, Bob, if, if that's, maybe we should talk about it. Could I ask a question on yeah, that? Um, Debbie B, is it okay? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. May I ask a question? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I, excuse my ignorance on, on this, on the, these international managers that we just, when we send them dollars, do we tell them specifically that they can not only go into developed countries or do they, they put it in their pool of funds? Well, uh, you're in funds with all of them. You're okay. not in separate accounts. Okay. So the, the funds are denominated in dollars, mm -hmm. but the companies that they're investing in, in those funds, they're investing in the, the local. Like this. Like their, their, their pie chart that they're showing. Yes. Okay. Now, so that, that's, that gives another question because with the Harding, they're showing 23% in emerging markets, and uh, the other is 27% in emerging markets. With our chart here, it's showing that we only have 4.64 in emerging markets, which I believe is Lazard and Wasich. No, it. I mean, Von Tobel and and Wasich. So the the asset allocation chart, you have one dedicated emerging market manager, and that's Von or two. I'm sorry, Von Tobel and Wasich. Right. Your dedicated emerging market manager. So from an asset allocation standpoint, that's what we're considering to be the emerging market allocation. The two other managers, Lazard and Martin Levener, they have the ability on an opportunistic basis to invest them in emerging markets. They're not making strategic allocations to emerging markets. I understand, but our dollars there, 25% approximately, is in emerging markets with the way they're investing, correct? Yes. According to their pie chart. So doesn't that mean that we could be overexposed in emerging markets because of that, and we don't know it because of this sheet? Or under, under, under in our international developed, and we don't know it? Yes, although we're looking at your international developed managers and those percentages, I think the intent of these targets are for that allocation to emerging markets not the dedicated emerging market managers, recognizing that you're going to get some emerging exposure on an opportunistic basis from your other managers. We could add to the, I mean, it wouldn't be on this chart. We could add a uh, display in, in your quarterly report that shows, rolls up all of your emerging exposure. Because right now, the way I see this, we have more emerging markets than we have developed markets. Right, but we, we know going in, when you hire Lazard and Harding Levener, that those portfolios are going to have some emerging market exposure in them. I, I agree, but in terms of us managing, if we're complying with our investment policy statement, it seems like we need to know how much exposure we have in emerging markets or whatever based upon this. So we can, we can add something to, to the report. It wouldn't be on this page because that's not how this, this front page of the ASAP is set up. This is intended at the, really at the manager level, the managers were calling emerging markets. So we're gonna have to, we would drill down underneath that. I mean, technically to go to that level, you would have, if you're gonna say you have 10% allocation to international, you're gonna have to look at all of your domestic managers as well. I agree. And I don't think that's what we were getting at in the, in the policy. There's no limits to foreign exposure, but we could drill down to, to that level. There's no limits to foreign exposure? There's target allocations to international equity, but it, it's, it's, not as, it's not intended to be as stringent to say we're going to look through each portfolio 
to what is non-U.S. exposure. There are other statements in your guidelines for your managers about how much non-U.S. exposure your domestic managers can have. And I don't have those in front of me, but generally we, we limit it to 10 to 15 percent of their exposure. Is that the intent of our investment policy statement, that, that we don't look at that? Right. No, we don't look, you don't, we don't go to each one of them and go to each one of them and say, you can't go in here. No, 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 I, I know that, but I mean, in terms of your, I mean, that would be the only way that, what you're, under your definition, I think, is the only way you'd be able to do it. Yeah, we don't tell the managers, but, but we need to know our exposure in emerging markets, because well, we, it tanks and we're overexposed and it hurts us. We do tell the managers how much they can have. I mean, we. Yeah, it's in the policy. They can't go over, ten, I believe it's 10 percent, isn't it? The Czar did say 15 percent, but their, their, their book shows something different. But uh, I'm just looking at Lazard here before that. It's uh, page five on Lazard. Okay, first of all, that's the firm, Lazard, that's not the strategy that, that you're in. Okay, that was in my, my initial question, so sorry. Okay. Um, the strategy that you're in has 13.7% in emerging mm -hmm. markets. And the weight of it in your portfolio is about four point two. So it's about forty basis points. Yeah, point five or, or so, of, yes. Of exposure. So you add that to your four point six, you're right at five. We don't have a, um, let's see, on the ASAP, we're not showing a min-max range. I noticed that, yes. Um, well, I, I just think it'd be beneficial, no, nothing else. To me, this is, a, this is a policy question. We should go back and look at the policy, and if you want to tighten up parameters. Or, or at least have a pie chart with everything of where we're at. If it, happens. But it needs to tie to the policy. What, what's in the policy and what we're, what we're measuring. So we can look at the policy and, and define those terms because what we're showing on the allocation and what we're intending to be showing on this allocation page, if you have a target of 5% to emerging markets, we're not talking, we're talking about the emerging market managers, the exposure, the dedicated managers there. We're not taking that down to the next level. I'm not disagreeing that we should be looking at that or could be looking at that. But it's the same on the international side. Okay, that's that's what because, my understanding. Because we okay. could be looking into your your large cap managers. I'm certain there there are non-U.S. securities in the S&P 500 that, if you're technically saying foreign exposure, Schlumberger, Carnival Cruise Line, some large insurance companies are in the S&P 500 or the Russell 1000, but they're not domiciled in the U.S., their Bermuda or Cayman or other uh, benefit-driven corporation, they're traded on U.S. exchange and they're traded in dollars, but technically they're non-U.S. So we have statements in the guidelines for the managers as to they can only hold so much of that. Uh, again, those, those guidelines typically only apply to the separate accounts. So. Your international funds, we do, we recognize that they're going to, you know, the guidelines, those guidelines wouldn't be applicable to your international managers, but we do recognize that those strategies have some EM exposure. So we can define that in your policy that you don't want to have more than X percent in emerging market exposure, and that's at a, you know, we're going to look through not just to the managers that the dedicated managers, but it will have to look through uh, to the un 
all the all the managers and add that up. And we can just add that as a and, and that's talking about just the emerging markets allocation because really every every one of the managers would have some have some crossover into other categories, right? I mean yeah. even even in like large cap versus well even cap. the hedge the long short portfolio, it's it's a global equity long short portfolio. But if you're trying to look at the allocation by individual investments in every single manager, you at have the to security level, it's it it's that that's going to be a little bit more difficult. Right. Particularly because you're in funds. You know, a lot of your investments are in funds. We can roll things up and, and estimate, but it, it's it, to limit that or change it, we're gonna want to we're gonna want to define it with some bands around it that are fairly wide so that you have flexibility that you're not constantly having to sell out of funds. Yeah, you, you because, get yourself in trouble or we could right. find some managers wouldn't wouldn't deal with it. Because K two and PAMCO are gonna have some emerging market exposure as well or international exposure. They're they're intended to be global strategies. Jason, doesn't our policy take that into consideration uh, when we um, when we direct a certain amount towards a certain manager, for example, emerging market uh, if we're only uh, allocating 5% uh, or 10%, uh, is it taking into consideration the exposure that we might have with the other managers, it, or should it? I'm not sure that it's it's defined that way currently. When the, the asset allocation section of your policy is really intended to, it's defined by these, the broad category, or we're, we're including those managers that we're saying are dedicated to that. So right. your large cap, it's we're measuring your large cap exposure, U.S. exposure, based on what's with State Street and Intec. We're measuring your emerging market exposure based on what's in Wasatch and Von Tobel. We're not drilling down to the security level. We're looking at the at the manager. We can define it more broadly or more uh, more all encompassing. Uh, we'll have to create a different report for that because the way our report system is set up, it's looking at that top, that higher level. It's not something that can't be done. We can certainly do it, and it, it is important to know. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. You got anything else, sir? Uh, I, from a rebalancing standpoint for your cash needs, I think you're still taking pro rata from large cap and uh, core bonds. The core bonds are getting a little bit under the target, so I, uh, and small cap is, is a bit over. Um, I might suggest taking your next couple months cash flow needs from your two small cap managers. I don't know if that requires motion or or not, but just be no. Anything else? No. Okay, sir. Uh, item 14, or 16 rather, comments from, from board or staff. Only thing I have, uh, Renee, when is, I'm up for re-election in June, right? That's correct. Okay. But it wasn't for me. No. <laughs> <laughs> Can we, what would we need to do, yeah, to make it like every couple of years? It's every three, it's the, well, one person rotates. Each elected person has a three-year term, so they roll. So oh, every okay. year we have an election, but not for the same individual. Okay, okay got it. Thank you. Uh, uh, Paul was the last. Paul was the last, yes. Paul was the last one. Okay, anybody else, any board members got anything? Yes, ma'am. I apologize. I was thinking about the, the officers. Um, chair. Yeah, I yes. was thinking about the chair and the vice chair. Yeah. So I apologize for that. Thank you. Anything else? Anybody else got anything? If not, we're adjourned.